Welcome to Spybrary. By spy fans, for spy fans. With Shane Whaley. Shane dives into the mystery and intrigue of spy books and movies. Both fact and fiction. Delivering reviews and interviews with authors, historians, intelligence experts, and spy fans. He discusses everything from John le Carre, Len Dayton, Ian Fleming, Tom Clancy, Brad Thor, and many more. If you love spy books and movies, keep listening. This podcast is for you. This is Spybrary. It's a brush pass, quick and simple. You are listening to Brush Pass on Spybrary. Quick reviews sent in by spy fans for spy fans. Good morning, good evening, wherever you may be. This is Matthew Kressel again, and I'm here making another brush pass for Spybury on another nonfiction book I recently finished reading. This one is Robert Seller's 2008 book, The Battle for Bond. It's a book that opens with this paragraph, quote, Cinema history might have been different if the first James Bond film had not been Dr. No starring Sean Connery, but Thunderball, directed by Alfred Hitchcock and starring Richard Burton as 007. It sounds preposterous and unbelievable, but it almost happened, end quote. As that may suggest, Siller's book is on the sordid history of Thunderball and the legal wranglings around this particular 007 outing. Not surprisingly, then, the book found itself the source of legal controversy when the Ian Fleming estate effectively pulped the first edition of it a decade ago. Thankfully, the material they laid claim to, letters and so forth of Fleming's relating to the court case, were removed, and the book had a second print run later that year. It's that edition, with a red banner in one corner proclaiming the book they tried to ban, and a forward by no less than Len Dayton, that I just finished reading. Moving on from Dayton's forward with his memories of Fleming and Irish film producer Kevin McClory, the book traces the history of Thunderball from the late 1950s to the death of McClory in 2006. The book, which runs about 250 pages with an index, can be broken into three sections. The first of which, which runs roughly 100 pages, covers the evolution of the original scripts that became the basis of Thunderball. The project seems born out of Fleming's wish to get a Bond project on the big screen and unhappy with failed efforts involving both Casino Royale and also Moonraker, seems overjoyed when his friend Ivar Bryce introduces him to McClory, who is keen on making an underwater epic. It's fascinating to read how the ideas unfold in meetings and letters. For example, how Fleming's at times a ludicrous original idea, such as bombs being stolen easily from an airbase in the UK, turned into things like the thrilling mid-air hijacking of the novel and later film. What's clear from reading this portion of the book is that what we've come to know as Thunderball was really born out of a combination of ideas from both men. Ideas knocked into shape by the screenwriter Jack Whittingham. We also find out about the efforts to put the film together, from early choices for Bond, including the aforementioned Burton, as well as how Hitchcock was approached, but passed in favor of a little film you may have heard of called Psycho. It's an informative read full of what-if moments, but also warning signs of what was to lay ahead. Those familiar with the Thunderball story will know what the, where the middle portion of the book's going to take readers, and that is the lawsuit, perhaps the one that had the most effect, both positive and negative, upon the films. Whenever the book gets into legal territory, as it inevitably does later on, including towards the very end, it becomes a bit dry for my tastes. That isn't to call it a bore by any means, but reading that, say, Fleming said such and such at court on this day and so forth, of course, provides information, but precious little else. In the end, the case gets decided in McClory's favor. And for a chapter or so, I got to discover that before he made the deal with Eon that led to the 1965 film, McClory tried to make the film on his own. And who did he go back to to play 007? None other than Burton, with the two men meeting in Toronto where Burton was performing a run of his soon-to-be-celebrated Hamlet, where they struck up a deal that was all but signed. As a Burton fan, it's hard not to be tantalized by the thought that 
The Welshman could have played Bond after all and came so close to doing so. The last portion of the book covers the two films made out of the Thunderball rights and some of the projects that weren't. Much of what was in the chapters about the making of the 1965 film, which incidentally is mine and Seller's favorite Bond film, I knew already, but it was fun to read all the same. The section on Never Say Never Again, the 1983 film, which is someone I have a fondness for, was far more illuminating with perspectives from a number of people involved, including the late director Irvin Kirshner. Kirshner, for example, tells a story of what happened when he was invited to play the film in a cinema at the heart of Soviet Moscow to row after row of Soviet military officers and a woman having to translate the film into Russian in real time. It reveals a chaotic production, one that McClory wasn't involved with, shockingly enough. And in some ways, it's amazing the film was finished and came out as good as it did, given an inexperienced producer who didn't get along with his star, whom he'd given a large amount of creative control over the production, perhaps a bit too much. But the chapter also goes at length into the Dayton co-scripted Warhead script from the 70s, and just why, despite announcement after announcement throughout the 80s and 90s, McClory never got another Bond film made. By virtue of when it was published, The Battle for Bond, of course, doesn't go into how the rights to Thunderball and Spectre ended up back with Eon and Danjag, leading, of course, to Spectre in 2015, or indeed the 2016 BBC radio adaptation of the Thunderball novel, which neither McClory nor Whittingham were credited with, incidentally. The Thunderball story, especially with the legal back and forth, is a complex one, and it's easy to take sides. Some Bond fans see McClory as an interloper, a leech who almost fed on the success off the Eon films, while others see him as someone who never really got his day, really, or the credit he deserved. What's clear from the book is that neither is quite true. McClory's drive and tenacity from surviving in a lifeboat for 14 days when the merchant ship he was on in World War II got torpedoed to seeing the screen potential of Bond before anyone else is really admirable. Yet it was those qualities, as well as his overambition, that proved to be his undoing, both in losing the confidence of Fleming and Bryce and in squandering the millions of dollars he made off of Thunderball. As Seller laments late, late in the text, quote, the millions McClory earned from his participation in Thunderball could have set him up for life. He could have used that fortune to create his own production company with which to make any film of his choice. Few, if any, filmmakers at the start of their careers have ever had the golden opportunity that McClory was given. But instead of using Bond as a fantastic platform from which to go on and do anything with his life, he threw it all away on an idiotic, solitary quest that ended in failure and which ostracized him from a film industry that could have given him so much more, end quote. And what about Fleming? At the end of the day, I think Fleming viewed Thunderball the way he did the various TV projects he'd worked on and adapted for the page in the form of Dr. No and some of the stories in For Your Eyes Only. Should he have at least acknowledged the role of the scripts, and in particular, McClory and Whittingham, in forming the novel? Certainly. But then, could anyone have first seen that it would lead to 50-plus years of legal troubles? I doubt that very much. After all, Fleming created Spectre, which ended up in the hands of McClory, oddly enough. In the end, Sellers suggests that the only winners of the battle for Bond were the lawyers, the ones who brought in money from various clients across countless court cases. I think us Bond fans won out, too. We ended up with an enjoyable novel, the biggest Bond film of the 1960s, and last but not least, Sean Connery's return to the role of Bond in Never Say Never Again. But, and it has to be said, the road to getting to all of that wasn't an easy one. For Bond fans curious in the behind-the-scenes history of the films, the story of the Thunderball rights issues, or wanting to explore a 007-themed what-if or two, it's a book well worth seeking out. So, until next time, be seeing you. Can you pull off a brush pass? Send in your review to Shane at spybrary.com. Thanks 
Thanks for listening to the Spybrary podcast. You don't have to wait for the next episode. Join the conversation happening now at facebook.com slash spybrary and on Twitter at spybrary. Hello, this is Harry Palmer, and you're listening to the Spy Brary Podcast with my friend Shane Whaley. Stay tuned, it's worth listening to.